Hi, everybody. Um, all right, got it. We're recording. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> it's great to be with you all this evening. Uh, I really enjoyed our little breakout. It's fun to hear people's stories and what brings us to this work. So in light of that, I actually think it's helpful to share a little bit about what brought me to this work of Final Five voting about four years ago, because I think that was a bit of a surprise. I saw Grace's eyes get big when I said four years, because it really has been a journey for this totally new policy topic to get to the point that it's at today. And it's actually a super exciting time to get involved and be engaged in Final Five voting. But for me, so really brief background, I, I was involved in health policy for about a decade prior to this work four years ago, shifting to Final Five voting, and frankly got really frustrated with the inability to get anything done from a policy perspective on something that, as we talked about in our small group, is one of those policy matters like so many policy topics out there where there are common sense, consensus oriented, compromise policy solutions out there that would move the needle on these huge national issues that are causing our country to really be in a precarious place because we're not solving them, but we don't solve them because somehow perfect is the enemy of the good in politics. And in gridlock is becoming status quo on these most challenging issues. So healthcare really felt like that. So I did what I think a lot of us do when we get frustrated. And I was like, well, too much of this policy work at the federal level. I'll keep trying to work on health policy, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get involved at the local level. So I ran for office in Madison where I lived at the time. I served on the city council in Madison for two terms and really enjoyed that local policy work of, you know, you, you get stuff done. You see tangible results in local government. A stop sign gets put in, the street gets repaved, the sewage gets treated, the garbage picked, picked up, right? All of those things really happen in a pragmatic way at the local level. Um, but I was still fighting these big policy issues on the national level. So all of a sudden, I'm a La Follette alumni. I went to the University of Wisconsin for undergrad and graduate school in Madison. And on the La Follette alumni listserv one day, there's a jobs listserv that comes through. And there was this job titled Executive Director Political Innovation. And I thought, what the heck is that, right? Click, because that sounds really interesting. What could that be? And I read Catherine Gale's original work in the Harvard Business School Press on politics and competition all the way back from 2017. And it was like a light bulb was going off for me, where it explained so much of this gridlock and lack of policy solutions that I was seeing in my day job in policy work, but also the political <laughs> realities that I was seeing in this elected official kind of local politics role of, gosh, like really the logical next step in politics is to run for partisan office. And that sounds terrible. It seems like you get nothing done if you move up in politics. Um, and so really it, it, it was just, like I said, a light bulb going off that explained so much. And that original report and that job, I ultimately got that job of executive director of political innovation, not knowing what the heck it meant, and spent the first couple of years of our work really forming what would become Democracy Found and Democracy Found Action here in Wisconsin, our campaigns for Final Five voting, but also our campaigns for Final Five voting all across the country. So since that original work on politics industry theory, Catherine Gale and her co-author, Michael Porter, published a book in 2020 called The Politics Industry. It was really the first articulation of what is now Final Five voting, this combination of political innovations that had happened in different, different ways in different um, areas of the country, kind of taking what's best out of various innovations, putting them together into what I believe is absolutely the most powerful policy solution we could possibly be working on. So that's the incredible nature of this federalist system that we live in is this ability to experiment at the state level when it comes to how our federal elected officials are elected. So California got to try top two. Washington state did a top two primary. Maine, where I'm sitting right now, has ranked choice voting in their party primaries and in their general elections. We've learned from these experiments to see that 
you know, again, I think final five voting, I don't have to convince you all on the call tonight is really the thing where we will most powerfully make a difference in the key piece that we care about. So from the very beginning at Democracy Found, we were focused not on who gets elected, but on what the incentives are for whomever gets elected to do when governing. And that's a very important distinction, right? Because we recognized that in so much of so many areas of our state in Wisconsin and all across the country, there are areas that are going to be quote unquote blue areas and areas that are gonna be quote unquote red areas. And as we were talking about again in our small group, there's not a lot of choice for you when you're kind of in this area where all of a sudden the party primary decides who your, who your candidate is before you even leave August. So as of right um, next week, we will know who is going to be a, our congressperson in seven of our eight congressional districts. We won't even have gotten to November. United America, an organization that we work really closely with on the federal level right now is tracking the primaries all across the country. If you haven't checked out their website on the primary problem, please do, it's fabulous. Um, really, I think the stats are right now that about 6% of the population has effectively elected already 55% of our members of Congress. So there's something totally wrong with that, not in that whoever is getting elected is necessarily a bad person. It's just that they are now only accountable to this small percentage of their electorate. And what we know about party primary voters is that they, even if we might think of them regularly, right? Democratic primary voters and Republican primary voters as two completely different groups of people they have this one thing in common, which is that above and beyond all other issues, they care the most about making sure that their side wins. It's this concept of you know, negative partisanship, this idea that, as I mentioned earlier, perfect is the enemy of the good. Compromise is not allowed or possible. And so all of a sudden when our elected officials are elected only by that segment of their electorate, that's who they're held captive by. They don't have the freedom to act any differently than on behalf of that small segment of voters. So I can't help myself, but try to explain to you all why I love final five voting. That's not what I was supposed to talk about today. So I'm gonna move on from that. But I can, talk, I can and do talk about final five voting all the time. It is my job. I love it. So um, if you have questions about the policy, happy to dive into that in the Q&A section uh, and that messaging work. But I think the thing that's helpful for you all this evening when thinking about where we're at in this long trajectory of the campaign towards final five voting here in Wisconsin is that it is a long trajectory. And it's been a very intentional one to date. So I wanna throw up a slide really quickly that I think will be helpful. So from the very beginning at Democracy Found, we recognized that in order to pass final five voting in Wisconsin, we had a legislative path to, pull up to, to passing this bill, right? We have to get a governor to sign a bill that is delivered to them by the legislature. So you have to pass state legislation to change the way our federal elections are run. So they are ultimately our constituency that matters elected officials, right? It is not about necessarily persuading huge numbers of the electorate. We are not a ballot initiative state. In other states like Alaska, who have moved faster than us on this policy change, they have binding ballot initiatives, binding referendums. So their campaign was different because it was entirely focused on getting voters to want to vote for final five voting. We need elected officials to vote for final five voting. So we have to be in my kind of frank assessment of the situation, a little bit more ruthlessly pragmatic and um, kind of harsh with ourselves about what is important when it comes to moving final five voting in, in Wisconsin. So we also recognize that in order to pass it, you have to kind of box in, that's what this box is, right? Box in the legislators so that there's no way out when it comes to final five voting. This is the path forward. And the key to this in our strategy was sequencing. So not necessarily starting with grassroots advocacy, but instead starting with grass tops. So when I say grass tops, I mean the business owners, the job creators, the political elites, you know, quote unquote, who have, um, who have a, a 
reputation, a credibility with elected officials to give credibility to this rather wonky policy topic that no one knew what the heck it was, right? Final five voting is still something that so many people don't know anything about. Starting there, right? You so have put sure me in the car. I didn't know that there's, um, that there's political leadership. So in this case, it's it, we talk a lot about like the political, the federal delegation. They don't actually have to vote on this, but if the federal delegation says no way do we want this change, then no way our state legislators are going to pass it, right? You have to make sure you have opinion leaders. So editorial boards, talk radio columnists, people who have sway with elected officials on board. Um, excitingly, the Wisconsin State Journal, the La Crosse Tribune have both editorialized already in favor of final five voting. Had a really great op-ed in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Other kind of publications all across the state have moved on final five. And the last piece is really this piece that we're talking about tonight, grassroots advocacy and grassroots targeted advocacy. So making sure that we're being strategic in the way we do grassroots advocacy for final five voting in Wisconsin so that it is most effective. So uh, I know that's kind of a lot and a bit detailed, but I think it's helpful to have that context about how really, as I said earlier, ruthlessly pragmatic we have to be about the path to final five voting in Wisconsin if we want to be successful. So also from the beginning, we recognize that in many cases in politics, when you're persuading elected officials, the messenger often matters far more than the message, right? So there are some people who, who are going to have sway with certain elected officials. And there are some people where if they said the exact same thing to that elected official, all of a sudden it's heard entirely differently. We might wish that were not the case, but again, ruthlessly pragmatic, that is the case. So if that's the reality that we're dealing with, that's the reality that we're dealing with. So we were, again, still trying to make sure that every time there's a contact with a state legislator, it's a contact that's made from a trusted source, from a relationship that's already there, someone that they um, know is generally someone they agree with or trust or respect rather than being that uh, contact from someone who's a traditional thorn in their side. So sometimes we have to look in the mirror and I had to, as the Madisonian in my group, um, starting out, recognize that, look friends and, friends and family in Madison, we don't need you to lead on final five voting. It is not helpful for the Madison liberal, you know, whatever that they call Madison, 20 square miles surrounded by reality or however we want to describe Madison. If Madison runs with final five voting before the rest of the state, we're DOA, right? So this is not going to move us forward. Uh, so a lot of that sequencing was really, really important to getting to the place where, as you all know, bi bipartisan legislation for final five voting introduced last session and trying to put ourselves in a position where next session we can pass the legislation in the state legislature. So my ask of you all tonight is to remember that ruthlessly pragmatic challenge that we're facing, which is the Republicans are in charge of the state legislature, right? So ultimately we have to get through a Republican state legislature for final five voting. So we need Republican messengers talking to Republicans. We need Democratic messengers talking to Democrats to some degree. Um, but that's not going to actually get the votes to win because ultimately the votes that you need are the Republican votes because guess what? The state Senate doesn't bring a vote to the floor unless they have the majority of the majority caucus already in support of it. So even if you have all the Democrats and a couple Republicans and you think you have majority support, your bill's not moving. You're not going to get a vote on it. So again, these are the inside weeds that put us in a place where when we think about the need for final five voting, the work that you all are doing on house parties and awareness building is actually the most important work that you can do. The legislative advocacy is the secondary and the candidate advocacy lower priority. I would much rather build support and awareness in where you all are in Northwest, North Central Wisconsin to have a coalition of truly cross-partisan supporters. So there's no way that we can be pegged as this being a Democratic issue or a Republican issue, it is truly an issue that everybody cares about. So having these house parties, these awareness building events where it's a trusted messenger talking to a trusted messenger 
just as important on a person to person level as it is a person to a le well, legislators or people too, but a person to a legislator level, right? Um, because it's your friends and family, it's your network who are going to trust you to tell them about this weird thing called final five voting that could really make a difference when it comes to our broken politics. Otherwise, you're going to tell them that you're going to talk to them about politics and you're going to talk to them about politics in a nonpartisan way and people are going to laugh at you, uh, right? They're going to say, there's no way you can talk about politics without it being partisan. There's no way we can talk about politics in a cross-partisan uh, room anymore, right? But we can. We can and we do on Final Five voting all the time across Wisconsin. It is one of those unique things where we really do have both Republicans and Democrats and independents and everything in between coming together on this work for final five voting. So um, I'm trying to be a little bit cognizant of time because I wanna make sure that I answer any questions that you all have. But my ask for you all tonight is that when you are doing your work, please, please, please focus on that cross-partisan awareness building work and building the coalition of support first. And when you do, right, when you get to the place where you're looking to engage with candidates or elected officials, I would love to be your partner in that. We've spent a lot of time and a lot of money. We are spending $400,000 this cycle in political contributions to Wisconsinites on Final Five voting. I mean, this is a real thing, people. Right, and so this is something that we are treading very, very carefully on. And um, I sound like a little bit of a maniac when I get so dogmatic about it, but we have to be careful um, because I am so, I think we are so close to actually moving this in Wisconsin that I can't help but be excited every single day. And, and the way we're gonna do it is we're going to do it by getting those trusted messengers on board so that there's credibility with state legislators of the people they care about and trust. So let me just stop there because I could talk forever and see what questions you all have on the campaign for Final Five voting in Wisconsin that we are all a part of and I'm so excited to be doing the work with you all. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, yeah, do we have any questions um, at all? Nana, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, is there something you could send to us that would be like a cheat sheet to just have bullet points of things for us to really rely on to have conversations? And I mean, I'm still kind of a rookie with this, I feel like. Um, and I can do my own you know, research, but if you gave me a, a beginning, I'd appreciate it. I would be happy to. We have so many resources. Um, both kind of talking points, one pagers, podcasts, short interviews. I will send, um, I will send via Danny and Bill some information that they can get out, I'm sure. Um, because like I said, yeah, we've got tons of that stuff and yeah, happy, happy to do it. Um, there's a question in the chat that I just saw from Pat, um, Oh, primaries. Yeah, primaries. So primaries are confusing and they're frustrating to voters often because your vote, right? You have to choose in Wisconsin right now which primary you're going to vote in, right? Before Tuesday, you have to pick. Are you going to vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary? Where is your gonna vote going to matter more? So the value of Final Five is that you don't have to make that calculation anymore. You vote for your favorite candidate regardless of what party they're identified with. They still have a party affiliation after their name if they so choose, but you might say, hmm, in the gubernatorial race, I'm going to vote for the Republican candidate in the primary or yeah. And then right in the Democratic race, I would have said you, you might want to vote in the Democratic Senate race because there's competition, but that's kind of all gone out the wind in the past couple of weeks. But <laughs> Um, so there's still a primary in a final five system. It's just the top five primary. So it's a single ballot primary and the top five candidates advance to the general election. So that's the key that makes the general election the most important election. So the election that most people are voting in already becomes the election where the decision is made and there's actual competition of ideas and issues and credentials in that general election. So uh, still primaries in a final five system, just a top five primary instead of a party primary. 
What else? Other questions? You're welcome, Pat. Yeah, great. I have a question. Um, as, as we've been talking about Final Five and we were doing River Falls Days and chatting with people, I've, I've spoken to a number of people I know who are Republicans very clearly um, in that camp. And, and, and the reaction I'm getting is one of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Very suspicious. Uh, one of the things they, I, I've heard a couple of times now is, where's your money coming from? Who's funding this? And some advice on how to get past that hurdle so people realize this is not an effort to suddenly surreptitiously get all these Democrats elected. I, I, I'm not sure how to talk to them. Yes, Grace, thank you for asking that question because I used to say, I said early on that um, Republican conservatives are by nature more conservative, right? And so there's just an inherent skepticism towards changing status quo, especially when it comes to status quo on our, on our republic, on the way that we elect people, especially right now, right after the 2020 election. So that's the environment that we are in, which is why one, the messenger matters so much, but two, it matters to say that there are credible conservatives who support final five voting. So I often turn to the fact that Congressman Mike Gallagher has been a huge supporter and proponent of final five voting. He co-authored the foreword to Catherine Gill's book, The Politics Industry, with Chrissy Houlihan, who's a Democrat, his colleague in the, in the U.S. House, and said, like, look, when we, it was actually a really powerful message. I can share it in my follow-up materials, but they were both veterans. And as members of the military, you weren't on the blue team or the red team, it didn't matter. And that's why they got into service in Congress after retiring. And yet, as soon as they got to Congress, they were on the blue team or the red team. And it's not a, it's not a way we can actually solve problems. So sometimes it's that really heartfelt message that can kind of pierce through. If they're a ruthless partisan, here's what you got to like really focus on. Look, guys, we say this all, like, I had to convince, I have a lobbying team that's a truly cross-partisan lobbying team, a Democrat, an independent, and a Republican are the three principles. The Republican has been involved in electoral politics for a long time. I first took this topic to the independent because I worked with her on healthcare issues previously. And she said, well, I got to get my partner, Greg, on board if we take on, you know, you all as a client. So you got to convince Greg. Well, it was 2020. It was COVID. Greg has four young boys. And so he jokes that he trapped himself in his basement and ran through election scenarios, trying to figure out how Democrats were going to game final five voting to, you know, win and not elect Republicans. And he couldn't figure out a scenario where this system was going to inherently benefit Democrats over Republicans. This is a like, right, lifelong Republican political operative saying, I was super skeptical I was sure this was the way Democrats were trying to game the system and win, and I can't figure out how they're going to do it under this system. So it's those sorts of poking holes in the argument that have been really important to us from the beginning to overcoming some of that skepticism. Also, the fact that when you get the question, where's the money coming from? So Democracy Found that has been involved, you know, we were the creators of Final Five Voting. Our co-chair, Catherine Gale, is from Germantown. She ran Gale Foods in Germantown. She was an Obama bundler. She co-founded our organization with Austin Ramirez, who family funds one of the big choice schools in Milwaukee, Republican family. They came together to form this organization, Wisconsinites, Wisconsin money. I think to date, it's like 98% of our contributions for Democracy Found are Wisconsinites contributing to the campaign for Final Five voting. That is unlike any other policy issue that's being advocated for in the Capitol. So I could go on and on about this one, but um, I think there's a lot of conversation to be had around making sure that that credibility is there to overcoming that skepticism. And often it just requires a longer conversation. And if people are wanting to have a conversation with another Republican about this, I'm happy to help set that up. If you're not in a position to do that, don't hesitate to send them, you know, one of our team members was on the team. He now is in Milwaukee, but John Pudner, he ran the campaign that took out Eric Cantor in the primary and the Tea Party wave. And he is advocating for final five voting now in Republican party meetings and circles. And so, you know, we got 
you got the strong Republicans, you got strong Democrats who are together on this campaign for final five voting in Wisconsin because it is not partisan. Thank you. Any other questions for anyone? Hi, this is Carolyn. Um, Sarah, I have a question that um, I, it, it doesn't have anything to do with everything you just said, except except that at the very beginning, you, you uh, kind of quoted, made a quote that said, uh, the focus, focus is not on who gets elected, but, and I was so taken by it and listening to your words, I didn't write it down. And I want to write it down. So you can you repeat it for all of us to hear again? Yeah, and Carolyn, it is one of my big talking points. So you'll get it in my explainer of what final five voting is about as well, which is right. It's not about who gets elected. It's about the underlying incentives for whoever gets elected to get things done Perfect. for all of us, right? And, and that's not the most beautiful way of saying it, but it is. It's about incentives. It's not about people. And that is right. We're all looking for these change candidates all the time on both sides. And guess what? They're never able to do it because if the system is broken, you can't change the people until you can change the system. You can't change the corruption until you change the system. You can't put country over party until you change the system. Um, I could go on and on. No, Carolyn. I, I can't. It's a powerful, powerful, very concise statement. And, and I chair the League of Women Voters and wanted to bring it back to them next week at our board meeting. And it was like, I just didn't write it down. And it is so right. It's, it's not about voting on it. It's not about electing the candidate. It's about getting whatever done that needs to be done. So. And in different areas, that candidate's going to be different. So in sometimes people like to say that this is all about electing moderates. Well, guess what? In a super Republican or in a super Democratic district, this is going to elect a super Republican or a super Democrat, because that's who should be elected in those areas. Need. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's about making sure that it's the 60 to 80 percent of us who show up in the general election that we're actually being represented that we are the place that the accountability lies not with the 20 percent that vote in a primary thank you so much yeah alexi yeah i've been trying to think about how to how to phrase this question um and i i guess i'll i'll preface it with a you know you you were you were just saying, you know, it's it's not always about the the moderates. I'm not a moderate. I'm, you know, I'm a labor organizer. I am, right. by I'm sure many people's uh, standards, I am a radical leftist. And yeah, I, I can't even disagree with that. Um, you were talking earlier about, you know, ruthless pragmatism about going about this particular campaign um and you know so something that i know i've talked about with bill and i've talked about with danny is you know from from where i'm sitting there's not a whole lot that i can do personally because all of the people that we're trying to convince if i say something they're like let's do the opposite real quick um so I guess the, there's two things that I'm curious about here. One of them being, uh, do, you, do you have any suggestions from where you're sitting on uh, what I can do to further this particular campaign? Um, and also, what's, what's the end game here? Because as I understand it, the, the bill that we're, we're pushing for doesn't have any structural self-sustaining. Like it's not going to change things for how things work in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It's only going to change how we, how our state legislature controls up. So two great, questions there, feel great free to questions. field. Yeah, two, like. two different questions. So let me start maybe with the second question, which gets to a little bit answering the first question. So 
our so the bill that was introduced in Wisconsin is specifically focused on federal elections, right? U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate. That was intentional because strategy is choosing what not to do and biting off what you can chew. And getting elected officials to change the way that they are elected is a much bigger ask than getting them to change the way we elect those people in Washington, D.C. that nobody likes because Congress's approval rating is never higher than 20%, right? I mean, so this is like, a, it's, a, it's a bad, like it's, it's a good boogeyman in many ways, right? Washington, D.C. is a good boogeyman. And it's where this kind of issue of partisanship kind of is, is quote unquote the worst. You could argue, I could argue that it's gotten just as bad at, at the state level, but strategy is choosing what not to do. So you start somewhere, right? And if you start at the federal level, and if you're focused on issues that are of national significance and need pragmatic solutions, it doesn't take that much. So think about the U.S. Senate. And think about, you know, the gang of six, the gang of eight, all of these kind of groups of problem solvers that are the ones that get us to 60 votes on the handful of a couple things that sometimes we get to 60 votes on sometimes these days in the U.S. Senate. If there were more elected officials who were freed up to be account accountable to their entire state constituency, instead of just their party primary voters in red states or blue states in the U.S. Senate, you could expect expand that fulcrum of problem solvers in the U.S. Senate with just five states. So the end game for final five voting in the short term is five states by 2025. That gives you 10 U.S. senators with a different set of incentives, some, you know, 55, some number of U.S. House members, depending on which states they are, that you get you to these problem solving fulcrums of people who can be accountable to a different set of incentives and their entire constituencies instead of just their primary electorate constituency. So that's the end game in the near term. In the longer term, do I want final five voting for all elections, including our state races? Absolutely. Are we going to get that right now in the first go? Probably not. So let's focus on what we can get and what could actually make a really big difference, even if it were just five states. So right. Five states, Alaska's down. They do final five, four voting already. So we just have four states to go by 2025. It's absolutely doable. Um, so then your first question was like a very good, I appreciate the self-awareness. Like if I'm not the right messenger, who is the right messenger? And then what is my role in this? And I think that's where we all have to look at ourselves and our networks and think very strategically about who we are engaging with and who is the messenger to whom. So if you think about your spheres of influence, you know, who in your sphere of influence, who in your network has, you know, relationships with state legislators or elected officials or people who are more conservative? Do you have that network? If not, maybe you're a behind the scenes helper, not the public face helper, not the messenger to the elected official, but the one who helping others to create, craft their voice and bring their message to the elected officials. Like there's ways to be supportive and not necessarily be the messenger to the person who, as you said, if the message comes, are going to do exactly the opposite. So I think it's just that degree of self-awareness and recognizing like whose voices need to be elevated at different times in our campaign. Um, that's going to be what moves us, us forward in Wisconsin in a strategic and art of the possible way on this thing that's still going to be really hard and no guarantees we're going to get it done but guess what it's really worth fighting for even if we fail so um every day i have to remind myself of that <laughs> carolyn you look ready to say something no okay any other questions from anyone All right, well, I guess my, my pitch will be, I'm gonna send you all some follow-up information. You have a great group here. You've got experts in organizing and fabulous people who want to make a difference here. So lean on each other and lean on me. If you're getting questions that you don't know the answer to, please don't hesitate to reach out. Please ask if there are materials. Please ask if I've answered the question before. Because I can pretty much guarantee you that I've answered some version of the question before, and I'm 
happy to help you um, strategize on it. Alina could probably say the same thing, others in this world, right, in this work. So we are all a part of this great effort together. Yes, thank you. Um, Sarah, would you be able, if you don't want to, you don't have to, would you be able to drop your email in the chat yeah, in case anyone wants right to get now. out to you personally? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great to have you, Sarah. Um, and that information will all be very helpful. So um, as we wrap up here, um, I'm just going to make a few asks of all um, to see what you all, you know, get, are willing to do to try to help out Bridge the Divide and to help out um, with getting final five voting passed in Wisconsin. So I'm going to um share my screen here again and as i said earlier um we've got a few things coming up um we have got the pierce county fair from august 11th to 14th that goes from 9 a.m to 9 p.m every day um and that is in ellsworth and um a lot of our you know the the people involved with pc grow and bridge divide are in the Pierce County area or nearby to the Pierce County area. So um, if you can, if you could volunteer there, that would be great. Um, if not, we have plenty of other things to do. If you could be a house party host, uh, we're looking to have as many house parties as we can to try to spread the word on, on final five voting in um, Western Wisconsin. Or you could engage candidates as we plan on doing in, uh, you know, following the August primaries. And we are also looking for a volunteer coordinator, um, just in general, if you're looking for something bigger to do, um, to be involved. So um, I will invite you all to, uh, if you're willing to do any of these, one or two, or however many you're willing uh, to put in the chat, you know, if you want to volunteer at the fair, um, you can say, I'll volunteer at the fair, um, want to be a house party host, um, say, I'll host a house party, et cetera. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to have as many of you involved in the campaign as we can have, um, since we can't do it alone and we're grateful for all the support, um, any support we can get. So, uh, yeah, that's my ask for you all today. Danny, can I offer, um, how, what the fair experience might be like for people who are wondering what, what exactly happens, or maybe you went through this, the last meeting, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, you can go through it. Yep. I'll just share. Um, uh, I did River Falls days. There were a handful of us working it and we had bowls of different colored. Um, oh, shoot. What were the candies again, Danny? It was Starburst. Starburst. So the yellow Starburst were in a bowl, the purple Starburst, the green. And of course, that drew kids in because they'd see these big bowls of, you know, bright colored candy. And it was to give them an opportunity to say, to say this is how Final Five ranked choice voting works. And so by voting for something pretty innocuous candies, um, but it, it engaged people. And while the kids are messing with it, you talk to the adults, their parents, the people who are with them. And what I found is people really were willing to engage when you talk about, you know, things, things aren't working. Um, there's stalemate, there's whatever terminology is best to use. Um, they were intrigued by the bridge, the divide name, because like, yeah, we do need to do something. And I can say that the people we, I spoke with, I honestly don't know what their political affiliation was. Three hours, I talked to a lot of people. No one talked about party affiliation, but everyone nodded and agreed something's got to be done. It, it can't keep going like this. Uh, and that was really satisfying to engage in a conversation about something that maybe can help fix it. So um, if, if you're if you're super introvert, maybe this isn't for you, but if you like talking to people, it's a really satisfying thing. People do not attack you. They're actually really interested in what we have to say. Yes, for sure. Um, and the fair is gonna be a great way, you know, even just uh, if you give us, yeah, a couple hours at the booth, like it'll be a great way to talk to people and, um, you know, spread the word on final five voting. Uh, so it's very important. So yeah, with any, without further ado, I, I'll ask if anyone has any final questions. Um, and like I said, you can keep putting um, what you're willing to do in the chat if you're willing to be a fair volunteer 
house party hosts or anything like that. Um, and do we have any final questions at all? All right, nothing. Sounds good. So um, we'll be sending out a follow up email uh, after the meeting and um, Sarah will be providing us with some material um, to send to you all as well. Um, and we will be back in touch for our meeting next month. All right, thank you all.